Then I learned about the Stoics and learned about Stoicism through your writing. The impact that it's had on my life has been profound, beyond certainly your specific writings, like understanding what Stoicism is and how that can be applied to your everyday life. Thanks everyone for coming. Is this on? Yeah, we're good. Ryan, I can't see you. Yeah, yeah, let's move this back. How's that? It's good, that looks nice. Looks really I actually haven't seen this in the flesh. So Barnes & Noble has their own edition and this is very, very cool. It's the only one, it's the only edition with a ribbon. Fancy fact, <laughs> fancy fact. So how are you feeling from the run this morning? Casey and I ran 11 miles this morning. It was an off day for both of us. Uh, it was double what I normally do, so the opposite <laughs> of an off day. Do you, you're a morning exercise person. Why is that? For reasons that will provide us with an excellent sub uh, segue in today's discussion, but um, my kids have to be up at like 7.15 to get to school. So kind of like the only practical time of day for me to get it in is before the kids have to be woken up. So like my deadline, like when I have to be done with all my exercise, my like Casey time for the day is pre like pre 7 a.m. But it's not like you have a job. You could do it any time during the day. Yeah, but like once you once you like fall back on that thing where you're like, ah, I'll run at 10. And then it's like noon and you're like, nah, I'll just go get lunch. And then it's like three. And then before you know it, you've got like one of those mobility carts and you're just kind of like watching TV all the time and you're like you know, watching Coco Melon on your iPad and you're getting nothing done. No, I think that's, that's interesting. Cause yeah, it's like, once you start the habit of pushing, then you're, you've probably, you're probably already, you're already admitting to yourself that you're not going to do it. Yeah. Don't you have like a great Marcus Aurelius quote about this? Uh, probably. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, I feel like I did this because of one of your quotes. Let's see. Well, he has a great one about getting up in the morning, which I love. He says, well, is this what you were put here to do to stay under the covers and be warm? Is this what you were put on this planet to do, which I like? But Seneca's thing is that he says, um, the one thing fools have in common is that they're always getting ready to start. So you're about to do it. Like, I got to finish this thing first. I'll do it after. So I think there's something about owning, the, doing it first, crossing it off the list. That's really, really good. It's such a healthy practice when you have little kids because when you get up at 4.30 in the morning, you are like fucking exhausted <laughs> by eight o'clock at night. My bedtime is nine o'clock. This will be the latest I've stayed up in months. <laughs> and I do that because I fall asleep when my kids fall asleep. Like I have the same sleep schedule as a four-year-old. Yeah. And I find it to be a very healthy thing to do. And I think that my children appreciate that because I'm with them at night. We're on the same cadence. I'm not like get the bed kids so I can watch, you know, the real housewives of Beverly Hills. Yeah. I'm like, kids, come on, let's all fall asleep. And I'm the first one out. Yeah. There, I, I have this story in discipline is destiny, but the Toni Morrison thing was she had to get up and do her writing before she heard the word mom in the morning. Before she heard. Yeah. So if, if you get, if you get it done, whether it's the workout or the writing, or the alone time, or the meditation. You want to do it before you've started the clock as a parent, if you can, which I think is really interesting advice. Um, that I don't work, that, that, that doesn't work for me, but I do think the idea of getting, crossing something off the list as early as possible before you're already tired, before you're already making compromises, before you're already, you know, into the shit. There's something about like the fact that when my children wake up every day, yeah. when I wake them up, I like splashing water on them or whatever I do to get those little rascals out of bed. I've been up for three hours yeah. and have gotten like a half a day. Like I think there's some, there's a valuable lesson there. What are other parts of your routine or is it, you just cross that off the list and then it's chaos from there? Yeah. I mean like getting the kids to school every morning, I think is one of the most valuable things as a parent, those sorts of routines. Yeah. My children, like with breakfast, those sorts of routines, like consistency as a parent, I've found to be is one of the kind of the most rewarding things from the, from a child's perspective. It's very hard to get into the mind of a four-year-old of an eight-year-old. But when there's consistency at hand, like you can really see the response from them. Yeah. What's interesting, right? Like you can see if your kid's routine is disrupted, you see how disrupted they are. 
right? Like if you normally do things a certain way, or if your life is chaos, you see how it manifests in their behavior. And then we're not that different. Like I, I realize that if I don't have a routine, I, my behavior suffers and my willpower suffers and my equanimity suffers. And so I think the idea is like, everyone should be on a sleep schedule. Everyone should be on a routine. It, it, it's a human thing as opposed to a uh, kid thing. Yeah. Also, there's like no easier way to look someone in the eye and say, I'm better than you. Then what time you woke up? I wake up at five in the morning every day. (laughs) That is a powerful. um, I think I've read all of your books, except I haven't read The Daily Dad yet. Well, it just came out. And and you shouldn't be more than one page into it. Just to be clear, it should take you a year. If anyone says they've finished, they already broke the rule and didn't make it through the intro. It's very clearly, it's one page a day. But I've, I've been a, you know, Ryan and I have a very interesting history where we met at this outrageous, are we allowed to talk about this? I think so, I don't think it was secret. We met at this outrageous Google event at a castle in England where they had like, like when I say Ryan and I were the least important people there, I mean like if there's a spectrum of one to a hundred, Everyone there was in the 90 to 100 range, and we were in single digits. Like, we were so out of our league at this event, at this castle that they had rented up, and we ended up spending a lot of time together. Well, for some reason, it was you, me, and, like, two other people. We had to stay in the castle. Like, they didn't put us in a hotel. So then all the adults left, and then it was just us in the in the castle. And it was a castle, but it was more like it's it was a, an English estate. It was called Clevedon. I don't know, it's this like thing, it was the craziest house that I've ever been in, and then they just left for very irresponsible people to stay in, in the castle by One ourselves. One of whom was Tom Hooper, the guy who had just directed and won the Academy Award for the King's Speech. Yeah. And I remember like three in the morning, we got in trouble because we were all pissed drunk playing on some like construction site outside. Wasn't there a slide for some reason? Like a like a slide from a circus? You know, like the, the Yeah, it was either that or that it was the shoot that the construction workers threw the garbage down. Like that, yeah. But when the management yelled at us, I remember Tom fought back. Like, how dare you? And I was like, how British. This is fantastic. But we've known each other since then. Oh, actually, to give people a sense of, of who... Um, how, how this event was, there was like, if you go to conferences, sometimes it's like, and then we're all going to do a joint run in the morning, you know, and it'll be like, we're all going for a one mile run together because it's like, you know, lowest common denominator. And then who, they had like... The guy who just won the Olympics for like... Yeah, Mo... Yeah, yeah Mo for... for, for Fera, something uh, like that. Whatever his name is. But the guy Anyways, who, he had just yeah. won the fucking Olympic gold. Yes. That, that, was who le- that was who Google paid to come in just to lead this one run of Google executives. And us assholes. Yeah. Um, but we got to know each other then. And it, I think it was an interesting sort of inflection point in both of our careers. Um, and it was before I had both of my two daughters, before your cho- you had just been married or were just about to get yes. married. Um, and I think that our, our friendship, uh, personal friendship and our professional relationship sort of grew from there. And it's been really interesting for me to, to learn about you personally as a friend, but then also learn about you through your writings. And like conspiracy was an all time favorite because so fucking pulpy and just like gossipy and page turny and fun. But then I learned about the Stoics and learned about Stoicism through your writing. And I like the impact that it's had on my life has been profound beyond certainly your specific writings, like understanding what Stoicism is and and how that can be applied to your everyday life. And I'm curious about like how you dovetailed those themes with a book about parenting. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we would have met, I think it was 10 years ago. I was just thinking about this, um, almost exactly. So getting old. Yeah. Very. Um, but I, and I think the obstacle would, the, the obstacles, the way had just come out. Um, so that would have been my first book about Stoic philosophy. And then the daily Stoic would have come out a little bit later than that. I got so much out of writing the Daily Stoic, like the idea of doing one page of Stoic philosophy every day, and then obviously I've kept that going with the email. So I've basically written that book, a new version of that book every year since 2016, that when we had kids, 
I was like, I think that would make me a better parent to do that same process. So obviously the book is for you, but writing it was very much for me. The idea of like, what do I think? What are my sort of principles? What are lessons about two that people should do or should not do from figures from history and philosophy? That that was the idea in the book. But I, I'm I think what's weird if you if you went to the parenting section here, Barnes and Noble, you would see uh, a lot of books, some of which are interesting, some of which are not. I would say most of the books for dudes are very patronizing. It's like, let's put a cowboy hat on the cover or something, right? It's like, like ha, ha, or we'll make it camouflage. That'll, that, like, and, and I actually remember Adrian's, my publisher is here, and he was, when I was proposing the book, he was like, uh, men don't buy parenting books. That's what he said. That was a fact of the industry, which is true. But I think the reason that's true and the reason why parenting books are, with the exception of, say, what to expect when you're expecting not great sellers, is that it's insane to read about some problem you might have 22 years from now, right? So you're reading a book about this thing that you never stop doing. You're always a parent once you become one. But how could you, how could you read about that in the course of a week and then retain that knowledge? So I, I think there, what I think is special about this format or what I'm trying to do is that it's a book not only that you read in small chunks, but ideally you read over and over again. I, I don't know I don't know how to put this into a question, but I, something that's interesting is like some my wife and I read a number of parenting books yeah. and she highlights a page or, or or you know folds down a page and it's like, honey, you have to read this. And that has sort of shifted where now she and I are in this sort of perpetual state of sending each other, don't laugh, because this is serious. You, you can laugh, it's fucking ridiculous. Sending each other TikToks. <laughs> Do the same thing. Sure. From pediatricians and then just from like people who think they know something and they usually do. And yeah. they're good at compartmentalizing it into these little videos and it's interesting and it's helpful and it makes me feel understood. And I think something that you've done that has been very interesting for me to to watch as someone who's sort of built my own career on social media is like you, you're an you're an author. I think they called you a media strategist, but I, you know, like I see you as an author. I see you yes. as someone who's able to take ideas and put them on paper and communicate those ideas in a way that people are able to digest them. But in the last decade, you have leaned into social media, into podcasting. I follow all of your multiple feeds that you or your entities produce on. <laughs> on I can't, if you're yes. doing all that, then I don't know when you sleep. No, but on social media. And like I'm, I'm curious about that transition. About that, it's not a transition. That's because you're still writing. But I'm curious about how you came to that and what it's like when people come up to you saying, "I love your Instagram videos" or "I love your YouTube videos," versus "I've read all your books." Yeah, I'm, I'm a like in the same way that. So when you write a book, obviously it gets translated into different languages. Like I don't also write the Spanish version, or it would be unintelligible uh you know i i don't even i don't even see like the german or the french or these other versions like they just ship them to you after they're done like and you're like oh that's an interesting okay, choice yeah, right. yeah um and uh so it just happens right but the idea is that obviously there's people who read primarily in french and people who read in german people who read in czech people who read in russian in any language and so um that's how you expand the reach of what you're doing. And the way I have come to understand is like, I'm a book first person. That's how I consume information. If I wanted to learn, I'm becoming a parent, I'd go read a parenting book, right? Or if I wanted to learn about this country I was going to, I would read a book about that thing. Or I want to learn about the Civil War, I'm going to read a bunch of books about the Civil War. But that's not how a lot of people learn. And that's certainly not the easiest entry point into stuff. And so I think about it as like, I write the books, and I think primarily in long form, and then I have a team that helps me translate that into shorter and tighter things that bring people in. And it, it's, it's weird. The, the books have been this sort of slow, steady climb. And then somewhere around 2020, we started doing this more in the social media stuff. Like, I guess we've had the Instagram account for Daily Stokes since 2016. But we really invested, especially in like video stuff. And it's just been explosive because... The same thing you're saying with the parenting ones. It's it's actually a great medium to encapsulate like an entry point into an idea or a concept. And then if someone wants to go further from there, that's what they do. And I think I I really learned from your stuff, which is like, how do you do like 
respecting whatever the medium is and deciding to do it at, at a high level, right? So like um, actually figuring out what works, what doesn't, um, you know, actually investing in quality and all those things. Uh, so yeah, it's been it's been a slow journey, which I'm not I, to this day. I'm not sort of naturally comfortable in, but it, it's so it's been a stretch out of my comfort zone. But usually, when you find you, that you stretched out of your comfort zone, you end up learning and experiencing, and usually reap you know sort of cool benefits from. That. I say this very gently, but like, do you see those outlets, those social media outlets, as legitimate ways for you to communicate? the ideas and themes that you write about totally. or you do. Totally. Yeah. Like I used to, I used to talk, I, I used to do a lot of consulting for other authors. That's the media strategist thing. And I would, I would go like they're, they're you know, their books out in six months. I would go, I'm going to describe a scenario to you in which your book sells zero copies, but you know, the title, the phrase you've come up with enters sort of the cultural consciousness the idea people start it becomes a buzzword people start talking about it people talk about it in business meetings right it you hear from people that say you know that changed my life right i'm describing a scenario in which the book has a huge impact right it penetrates it makes it changes things uh it, it wakes people up it leads to an investigation or changes who wins an election right? a bunch of stuff that could happen but it doesn't translate into commercial sales in any way. I said, would you accept that as success? And invariably they say, yeah, of course, because nobody chooses to write a book because their main motivation is to make a lot of money. It's like the worst way you could possibly do that. Like uh, people sometimes go, oh, he writes about stoicism to make money. And it's like, uh, yeah, yeah, that's why, that's why I write long books about an obscure school of ancient philosophy, right? Like. Um, Books are books are not it, right? You you work on Wall Street. You do literally anything else. So, which is actually uh, to, as an aside, because it's something I wrote down. I want to talk about. I remember after we met, I came here to your studio and we were hanging out, and you gave me a really good piece of advice, which I think is worth repeating. Casey said, um, he said both of us are not interested in in making money, and I said we're not, and he said yeah. If, if all we cared about was making money, we'd work at an ad agency. And I said, oh, that's, an, that's true. Well, that's why I don't work in an ad agency. It doesn't seem like cool work. And then you said, the, you, said you, make, you, you don't make art to make money. You make money to make more art, which has changed how I think about it. So the books have been successful, and I have done things that have made money. And I think about that as the funding mechanism to make all this other stuff, the videos, uh, social media posts, that produces the podcast. Like the at this point, Daily Stoic, the production budget and the staff is you know well into the very high six figures just to pay for all the stuff that gets made. So I make a lot of stuff that does not make any money, right? You know, you, know, you get small checks here or there for uh, the TikTok creator fund or whatever, but that's not paying for what you're making. I'm making that stuff because I feel like I really care about it. And if that's the medium in which I'm going to reach someone or they're going to get access to the ideas, I actually don't care if they buy the book or not. What I care about is if in that 60 seconds, they learn about something that I have talked about in the books and enough people do buy the books that it's, it works out. So I, I, I not only think about them as uh, like um, quality mediums, but I think about it as... Um, that you have an obligation once you've succeeded to expand out into the other things if you're if you can because you, what you should really care about is the propagation of the message or the ideas not trying to like capture it between the two covers or you only want to reach people who purchased it on iTunes or whatever it is a funny a funny parenthetical about you're talking about nobody buys your book but it has social cultural yeah. relevance my friends Ariel Shulman and Henry Juice, brilliant filmmakers, and about 15 years ago they made a documentary about this woman who turned out not to be who she said she was online. And they showed my brother and me the video, uh, the movie. It was a feature film, like before they submitted it to festivals. Like, what do you think? And we watched it through. And I was like, wow, this is like the gnarliest Facebook kind of expose I've ever seen. What are you going to call it? And they're like, we're not sure. And there's this line at the end of the movie that, like, this woman who's like this liar, this 
this bullshitter pretended to be someone else, this con woman, um, where this old guy sitting on a porch is like, you know, what I can say about her is that when they ship fish around the world, they throw a catfish in the, with the, in the aquarium to keep all the other fish moving, keeping them on their toes. And when we're discussing what the movie should be called, my brother Van goes, Catfish. That's the name of your movie, Catfish. And I was like, what kind of fucking name is Catfish? That'll never stick. No one will ever remember the name Catfish. And Catfish now has become such a part of the global lexicon. You can go get the dictionary from the printed dictionary. Catfish is in there. And it's like that, that word that they invented had the profundity of that word that they invented has has gone around the world a hundred times more than the fantastic movie that they made. Yeah, and who would trade that kind of impact sure. for the film what being twenty percent? Yeah, right. Exactly. If you, that's that's what you're trying to do. And I think there's there's something stoic in that too, which is like at a certain point you have to make something that you're really proud of, and you have to understand that like sometimes it, it's explosive and sometimes it's not, and you have to be happy with it. But if, if your only definition of success is measured in like copies sold or, you know, dollars earned, you know, that's a very narrow definition. You, you've so narrowed the target, right? Like, but instead, if your expansion is like, does it have impact? Does it change people's lives? Does it influence other people? You know, like I have a chapter in the book that I'm writing now, which will be the fourth, no, the third book in the... How many books have you written, Ryan? I actually don't. I think it's 12, but... Um, How old are you? I actually don't know the answer to that. I think I'm 36. Yes, I'm 36. I turned um, 42. Uh, but but Zero the, books. The, the point is, uh, it, if in sports, like you, there's two ways to measure like someone's legacy, right? First is like, how many games did you win? How many home runs did you hit? Whatever, it's that statistic. But like the, the best coaches are measured not in... Uh, how many wins they have, but they're measured in their, their coaching tree. Like who does their work impact? Like what coaches come up underneath them? Like Greg Popovich is undeniably the greatest coach in the history of the NBA. He hasn't won the most titles, but like last year it was two of his coaches head to head for the title, right? Uh, most, most matchups are one or both of the head coaches, or at least the assistant coaches, come from his coaching tree. So I, again, the idea, if you're as you're looking at your work, it's not just the raw numbers, but who are you influencing? What are you changing? So for me, like again, yeah, if the books hadn't sold at all, but stoicism had had the cultural resurgence that it's having, that would of course be something I was extremely proud of, and would be equally how I measured m whether I succeeded or failed at what I set out to do, which. That is what you're saying. Like, usually you have an idea, you have a concept, you have a story you want to tell, and you want people to see it. And then if you monetize a small fraction of that, good for you. You deserve it. Um, how, many people, how many parents in here? How many people? Whoa, there's so few parents in here. What do you say when someone says to you, like, I've got big news, we're having a baby. Yeah. Like, do you have any advice for me? Oh. Um, what, yeah. Where do you start? I'm actually, I was thinking about this because we were talking about routines. We had some friends that when they had their first kid, I was like, you guys need to start routines because they were like two, this was many years ago. They're two sort of work from home, self-employed right people. Gates, that's what you start. With. I was like, you got to, I was like, you, like, these were people who were like, oh yeah, well, you know, we go to bed whenever we wake up whenever we get started working whenever I was like, you got to start bringing some order to that chaos just as practice because you can't raise a kid in that. And so I was, I, it, it's just interesting. I, I, again, I think it's good for you, the individual, but it's critical in the house. Like you can't, you can't just be winging it. You gotta, I think the first thing is you gotta start getting some stuff in order. Cause it is like a, a hurricane happening in your house. If you're adding chaos on top of that chaos, I think you're never gonna get, you're never gonna get your arms wrapped around it. And it, that, has, that, has that advice that you give, would you say that shaped you as a parent? I mean, I, your I think uh, Tom Segura has this joke that I love where he says, like, you know, people say having a kid changes you. And he's like, no, having a kid should change you. 
right? Like, unfortunately, it doesn't, <clears throat> right? You've got to decide to make those changes. So I think, you know, that there was a, a lot of growing up. There was a lot of getting serious about things. I think that's actually, you know, and you know, and have you guys seen Knocked Up, the movie? <clears throat> Remember, there's a scene where she's like, "What do you mean you haven't read the baby books, right?" And he's like, "I, what do you?" Mean? There's this huge fight. He's like, "Why do the books matter?" It's funny. I think she, the reason she's saying the books matter isn't because there's actually that much good stuff in the books. It's about can you make even the most basic commitment to this being a thing that you are taking seriously. Right, and the the beginning of this book, I, I basically make this distinction between having kids and being a parent. And I know a lot of people that have kids, and I I know a fewer amount of people who are parents. Right, the decision to make this thing a central part of your life, to make the changes in how your life is structured, what you prioritize, what you get serious about, that I think is the critical, like big. Breakthrough. Yeah, I would say that like when people have one kid, yeah, they have a kid. Yeah. They're not parents they, because like one child, it's and you like can a, hand that kid off it's to a cool fashion yeah. accessory. Yeah. It's something to talk about. It's like the coolest arm candy. It's a child. Like it's yeah. so cool. Like how cute and fun and all. And two kids means like old me is dead, six feet under. <laughs> I am all in. I am fully committed. Yeah. I've completely turned that corner. Sure. And I think that, um, I think there's a lot of, I say that crassly, but there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. There's a kind of commitment that happens. You can wing it at first and then having to is like, oh no, this is, this is, this is like, this is it now. Yeah. And when people ask me about, especially new parents, um, when they say we're having to, like, what, do you, what advice? I prepare them for the horrors of parenthood. Yeah. Because I feel like as a parent, you feel obliged to talk about how beautiful and wonderful it is, which it is. Um, I've never not been a parent. And that is an absolutely wild statement to make. I have never not been a parent. I was a child and then I was a parent. I had a kid when I was a teenager. I've never not been. A, I've been a parent my entire adult life. There's never been a moment without yeah, it. You're like the story that parents don't want their teenagers to know because you had a kid in high school and it worked out for you. The kid worked out, you yeah, worked out. The best age to start thinking about parenthood is 15. <laughs> <laughs> um, but You're like the exception that proves the rule. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. But, but I, I do think that talking about the hardships, talking about the fact that like when you have a newborn in the house, it's mostly horrible. The child gives nothing back. Like there's, my kids are great. They're four and eight. Like Brandy and I play Minecraft till two in the morning. It's super fun. She's really good at it. But a newborn is nothing but like scary, uncertainty, what's coming next, exhaustion, fighting between you and your partner. The challenge is, and it is not sexy to talk about. It's not. And I find that the more... I mean, I always say it with a sense of sort of sardonicism. I always say it because otherwise you're just a fucking psychopath. But I mean every word that I say about how challenging it is. And I find that people find comfort in that because it's the sort of honesty that, that a lot of people are scared to confront. Well, there's two ways to think about it. One, which is, yeah, you, you go into this thing that's basically impossible to prepare, prepare for, but people haven't even attempted to prepare, right? There's that expression that like plans are worthless, but planning is everything. So if you haven't thought about it, if you haven't tried to make the decisions, you're trying to do it all on the fly, like you're going to get overwhelmed. And the Stoics talk about how, you know, um, the unexpected lands heaviest. So if you're just like, oh, it'll be awesome, you're going to get crushed. At the same time, I do feel like people are done a disservice when all they hear is how terrible it is. It's like, if it was exclusively terrible, people wouldn't be doing it, right? Like it is also profoundly rewarding and amazing. And I think there's, a, there's something weird too, and I, I do try to talk about it in the book, which is like, okay, so like I think we can, I don't think it's controversial to stipulate like moms have been doing most of the work for all of human history and society has been sort of rigged to make sure that that is the case when it comes to parenting, right? Um, and, and so like uh, that also though has deprived men of being way more involved and getting way more of the rewards of what is an amazing, rewarding 
beautiful experience, right? So, you know, men weren't in the hospital when kids were born. And then they were like, oh, I'll check in when they're six, you know, uh, when I start to take over their education or something. Like, like they've skipped all this wonderful stuff. There's a story I tell in the book where um, Winston Churchill is sitting with his son. His son is like, I think his son's already married. So his son's older. And they stay up late into the night talking. And it occurs to him, he goes, you know what? I think I've talked to you tonight more than my father talked to me in his entire life. And that's obviously an extreme case, but not that extreme, right? Um, like parents of this generation spend more time with their kids than the previous generation. The pre and you think about, like, that's not just, that wasn't just unfair. It was also really sad. And it cost both the kid and the parent one of the most wonderful things in the world, which is time together. Yeah, yeah. I, I think about that a lot. My, my, you know, my father had to work an unrelenting schedule to keep us above water when I was a kid. And like the the most, you know, the the most kind of concrete memory, the one that's most visceral, is him coming home from work because he would always come home from work just as we were about to go to bed. Yeah. And you know, when they were putting kids to bed, they fight tooth and nail. So like any moment of excitement is an excuse to not go to sleep and it, it lands particularly hard. And that's what I remember of my childhood when I think of both of my parents, when I think of, but especially my father, is that moment when you would hear like the, the bell ring because we had a bell on our front door and that meant he was home. And that was such an exciting, real thing. And I think about that a lot when it's like 5.30 and I'm at the office and it's like, could stay here till seven. I know I'm good till we got coverage till seven. I'm good till seven. And like almost every night I'm like, fuck it, I'm running home to hang out. I don't think I've ever regretted coming home early or Never. making more time. And yeah, there is this this sense, you know, they go like you only have 18 summers with your kids or 18 years with your kids. But it's way less than that. Right. Way less, way less than that because they're in school, you're working. They also only want to be around you for the first Six, seven years. Right. So you're like you. It's such you have, a raw deal. You know, you know that you're going to miss this time that you're in, right? And then you're like, ah, oh, but I got like emails to respond to, or you know, somebody. I think this is you and I have connected over this idea of saying no, right, to things because you get a lot of inbounds as I do. And what I try to remind myself is that when I'm saying yes to this thing, like I probably would as cool as that Google thing was, like if I got invited to it today. I'd, I'd be like, sorry, I don't want to get on. I don't want to fly across the ocean. You know, I, I would measure that in how many bedtimes I would miss. Right. That's how I kind of think about things. I think about I think about it in terms of how many bedtimes am I going to miss? Um, by the way, I lost the cards. I don't know where they went. So. Do you have them? Yeah. The, the questions. I made this movie called My Kid and Me. Yeah. About my son before my daughters were born. And I did this animation in it because it's a visual that's always been in my brain when trying to just comprehend what it is to, to lose your kid's childhood, like when they stop being children. And I drew it as like two points that start together and then they really grow distant and then they sort of come back together, if you can, if you can visualize yeah. that. And that is when they're children, when they're babies, they're 100% dependent on you. When they're newborns, they're literally 100% dependent on you. Their survival depends on your attention. My kid's four now, and she could probably figure out how to get the Cinnamon Toast Crunch if we left her alone for like three days. But the minute she's out of Cinnamon Toast Crunch, she's in trouble. So she still needs me, but slightly less. And that trajectory continues. Um, and it continues, in my experience, as a 42-year-old man who's been both a, a parent and obviously a son, um, it somewhat ironically starts to come back together when you yourself have children, because it's like that, that, that saying that is like, you will never love your children will never love you. Love might be the wrong word. Appreciate might be a more fair word, but you will, your children will never love you the way you love your children. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand that about my, it was incomprehensible. That my parents even liked me. <laughs> I fucking burned down the neighbor's house, man. And this is not a joke. I literally <laughs> burned down my neighbor's house. I was the worst kid that you could ever have until I had children. And then it was like, like I was pretty cute when I was little. Like, There's no way they didn't like me when I was a baby. Yeah. They felt what I'm feeling for my children. Sure.
Uh, do I ask you these questions? I don't. I, I can uh, give them to me. I'll, I'll I'll pick the ones I like. I was wondering why you handed them. I don't know. I right, let's go. Maybe I don't have. Them. Did we lose them? No, no, no. I got them. 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 But but yeah, like I met. So I measure like what I say yes or no to. I measure it in terms of like how many bedtimes am I going to miss, and. And I, it's, it's helpful for me. Like when, before I had kids, I was much less disciplined about saying yes or no to stuff. Cause I was like, I didn't want to hurt people's feelings. I wanted to do cool stuff. Even though I knew that was taking away from my work, it was taking away from my relationship with my wife, it was taking away from, it was contributing to burnout, any of that stuff. But, but then when you have, when you have opportunity costs personified in a cute, innocent, dependent thing that you love more than anything in the world, you're able to go, oh, I'm saying yes to you because you want to be on a conference call, which isn't necessary at all, um, or you want to meet in person about a thing that could be a five sentence email. And I'm saying yes to you because I don't want to argue with you. I don't want to hurt your feelings. But I'm saying no to this person who, by the way, I lie to myself and say, I do everything for them. I do it all for them. It's not true at all. No, you you are, and my wife's been saying this thing recently that I've been thinking a lot about. She's like, we're being um, too nice and that's making us not be kind. Meaning we're being nice to random people and then not being kind at home or to people we actually care about because we used it all up. Yeah, no, that is why I'm just perpetual asshole to everyone. Because all my nice is used up for my kids. I'm very, I very much appreciate you coming tonight, by the way. I know you, I, I never ask you for anything, and yeah, I appreciate you, you asking for this. <laughs> yes. my one ask. Son of a bitch. I'll talk to you in 10 years for, <laughs> for round two. Um, all right, we do have some questions. Let's see what we got here. Um, Casey, do you think it's more difficult to be present? And by the way, I was thinking about it. The secret to being a good parent, I've decided, is presence. Right? You have to give them lots and lots of presents. <laughs> Not gifts, the other kind of presents. You have to be with your kids when you're with your kids. So, hard, yes. so is it harder or easier to be present in New York City or California? How do you deal with the distraction, the busyness, the noise? We talked about this this morning. Yes. And I say this very gently because I've been very, very poor as a parent in New York City. When I first moved here, um, I had no money. My kid and me, uh, we lived in an SRO, which is effectively a halfway house. It was filled up with people who had just gotten out of jail and undocumented immigrants. We had a shared bathroom down the hall and no kitchen. It was 144 square feet. So when my little boy would wake up in the middle of the night, have to go pee, we'd have to put on shoes and grab our bathroom basket and walk down the hall and lock the door behind us. It wasn't safe and it was scary. With that caveat, I now live in a great house and my kids go to a great school and I'm just surrounded by privilege. So within that context, raising children in New York City, I think is one of the greatest places in the world to do it. It's absolutely wonderful. Like my children walk, they ride their scooters, but they don't get into a vehicle. They don't get into a train. They don't get into a car. They don't strap on a car seat to go from our house to school, to gymnastics, to swim class, to meet their friends. They don't leave our building to go hang out with their other friends. All their favorite restaurants you can see out of our window. So like when I was a child, all I ever wanted was to live in a city. And now I'm able to see that embodied, like I'm able to see that actualized through my children. And I find it to be tremendously easier. Like that burden, especially in Los Angeles, where we live for just a, a quick, embarrassing minute, and I'll never do it again. Um, and I apologize to all of you. <laughs> um, anything we wanted to do that was outside of the house required strapping the kids into the minivan, sitting in traffic, like the fighting, the arguing, the stress, the anxiety, all of that. It, remove all of that bullshit and then put them in a city surrounded by people, the sort of culture they're exposed to, what they see when we... Like every weekend, my wife and I pick a restaurant that's far away, New York City far away, outer borough. And we have to figure out how to get there. We have to figure out what they're going to see there. We expose, like our favorite place to take the kids is Chinatown, which is exactly a half a mile from our apartment. But to them, it's a different world. So no, I find it like not a little bit easier. I find it like on a level, I, I feel like the luckiest parent on the planet because I'm able to raise my kids in what is Disney World. So what, do, what 
does make it hard for you to be present then? Is it the phone? Is it work? Yeah, yeah, the phone. Yeah. I mean, like, I really like my kids, but they're no competition for, like, the algorithm that, uh, that like, makes Instagram work. Are you kidding me? My monkey brain versus Instagram's, like, ads or whatever the fuck they're pumping into my eyeballs all the time. There's no one to tell me no phone. And that sounds silly, but it is very hard. And my wife sent me a TikTok recently <laughs> where some guy with a beard is like, you put your, all your kids want is your attention. If you put your phone away at 6 p.m., I'm like, fuck, fucking bearded guy gets yeah. away again. Um, so we try to do that. Yeah. And one thing that we did, and this sounds preposterous, go back into the 80s when I was born and explain this to any 80s parent, and they would have no, this sounds like, this is absurd. We did never had TVs in our house here in New York City. We recently bought televisions on Amazon. They're like really cheap to buy like big flat TVs these days. And we put one in the kids' bedroom for their benefit. And it worked. So now like instead of the kids having they can't iPads do as at much night, on it? they can't touch it. Yeah. A decision has to be made collectively as a family, whether we're going to watch Encanto or Encanto it. Uh, again, we only watch in content. And <laughs> we watched it last night. It's all we watch. Um, before that, it was Frozen too. So there's something. But we watched this movie, and it's a shared experience. And because they only like movies they've seen a million times, we talk over it. So we're interacting with one another. Um, it, it feels like a much more communal, parental, legitimate experience versus handing a kid an iPad, which... Uh, as a parent, it literally feels like child abuse. And I think as we get older, we'll learn it is actually child abuse and wildly irresponsible. It's like giving a kid a pack of matches is better for their well-being than giving them an iPad. And, and these are sorts of like the little tricks we try to do to get them away from that. All right, so this question is, what is a philosopher and is this a standard that anyone can meet? That's definitely for you. Yeah. <laughs> So, so actually, this is interesting. Okay, so philosopher, I think, is very accessible and reachable for any person. This would be any person who loves or uh, studies wisdom, right? So philosophy, if we think about it as the pursuit of truth or wisdom, uh, a philosopher is anyone who takes up that pursuit. And Stoics would say there's a difference between being a philosopher and being a sage. A sage being the sort of penultimate state of studying philosophy, which I think they would say is actually impossible. It's a, it's a, it's a perfection that you are approaching, but you can never reach because it is always getting a little bit further as you get a little bit closer. So if we can make this distinction between philosophy being a thing, not just that, you know, tenured university professors get to pursue or, you know, um, you know, nerds get to pursue or whatever, philosophy is accessible and practical and, and actually quite useful to anyone and everyone, but that there, there, is the, there is a stage beyond merely the study of philosophy, some, some uh, you know, in the way that one reaches enlightenment or, you know, zen, this would be sage for the Stoics, so that's the highest level. So that's a great question. Um, oh, here's an interesting one for you, uh, and, and me, I'll answer it too, but... You're, they're basically talking about being great at being a parent and then also being ambitious in your profession or in your career. I know you, it's been interesting that you've sort of uh, worked a lot while you've had kids, you've worked less when you've had kids, you're kind of trying to find like a middle ground, it sounds like. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an, an impossible balance. And anyone who says that you can be like a, that you can be operating from a, like as a, a business an entrepreneur, a business person, uh, someone who has career ambitions, someone who says they can fire on all cylinders doing that and being a parent is full of shit. Um, they're lying to you. It is impossible. And I think that I've been extremely fortunate in the timing of my own career. I think about this all the time. In the timing of my own career, that I was able to sort of thread those needles. And what that means very literally is like, you know, I raised my son as a single parent. Um, his mother and I have always had a wonderful relationship, but he's either with his mom or he's with me, as you know, most kids of, of, of with, with their parents split. That's just how it works. And what that meant was I was able to sort of bifurcate my life in a very literal, literal way. The four days a week that I was not with my kid, it was just 
pedal to the ground, go. And then I was with my kid, like, you know, everything had to be turned off. We weren't even in the city a lot of the time. And that made it sort of easy. It was very black and white. And then once my career really started to take off, you know, he was a teenager. And there was a lot more malleability in, in our relationship, a lot more flexibility. It also afforded us opportunities that w- weren't lost on either of us. And then with my two daughters now, you know, like, really, for me, it was the 2010, 2012, later, 2012 to 2014 was when, like, I was at MIT. I started a technology company. I started a daily show on YouTube. And I ran a technology company, a venture back one. I had 30 employees while making a video a day, every day for 800 days in a row. All of that chaos was happening while my son Owen was age 16. He's finishing high school. Like he still wanted to hang out, but it was like, no, he'd rather be with his friends. You know, your role as a parent then is much more, uh, it's much more of a title than it is an actual practice. And, you know, my daughter, Francine, was born right sort of in the beginning of that. And as she got older and then my second daughter was born, I sold my company and I stopped doing the daily show because I was losing my fucking mind. And then, like, it was wonderful. Like, I had a very lucrative exit from selling my technology company. And for the first time in my life, I had some sense of financial security. And when I took a step back and it was like, what do I want to do now that I've, I've achieved this thing that I've been trying to accomplish for two decades, having actual money and not having to stress where my next meal is going to come from. It was like, do I want to buy a Lambo? And it was like, no, fuck that. Like, let me buy time. And that's what we did. Um, we just like spent all of the money on, on, I still do. It's like, it's the only thing I really value is time. There's a quote I have in the book, I'm forgetting who it's from, but she says something like, kids should be the center of your life, but not the whole of your life, right? And so the idea that you uh, invest in them, it's this core part of who you are, it's why you do what you do, is I think part of it. And then the tension, but also the connection is there that they should see you striving and growing and doing things. Like it, it would be sad there, there's another quote I have in the book. It was from Susan Strait, who's this great novel. She was talking about how um, she, her, her mother told her when she was a kid, she was like, when you get married, you lose half your life. And then she's like, when you lose, when you have kids, you lose the other half, right? That is a terrible thing to both say. It's terrible that it's true for some people, so but, but it's, all, it's also, that's a, sad, that's a sad statement about your life, right? That, that like your kids when they look back on your life, they're like, oh, that's when it stopped. That's when they stopped growing. That's when they stopped changing. That's when the, their work started to, uh, like the quality of their work went down. Like, I, th- I think that's a bad message to show to your kids that like you were frozen in place when they were born, that you never produced anything good after that, right? So, so anyways, I, th- I think it's a tension. You, you, your kids have to be both central to who you are and what you do, but you, they can't, that you have to show them what is still possible while you have them in your life, which I, there's a related question. Someone was saying, how do you encourage contentment and satisfaction while still cultivating ambition? I think this is a similar thing where ideally you, when you have kids, you go, this is everything I've ever wanted. Like you thought what you were achieving in your career was going to give you satisfaction and happiness. And then you realize that it was nothing compared to these people you're bringing in the world. That's part. But that doesn't mean you stop doing stuff. I think what it means then is that you no longer have anything you have to prove, that you're no longer doing the stuff from a place of thirst. You're, you're making work that you care about because you care about it, as opposed to doing work because you have something you need to show, you're doing work because you're trying to prove someone wrong. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like I do better, more secure work now that I have kids. Also because I have a spouse and I have like a system and a life that keeps me balanced. I think I look at the stack of work I made before I had kids and it is dwarfed by the stack of work that I made since I had kids. And I, I think that having kids and getting married, et cetera. Like people think like being in a relationship, they go, I don't have time. I'm too dedicated to my career. 
I would say that all those things have helped me in my career. I don't know if you agree. Or yeah, hundred like percent. I, I, when I meet really ambitious people, really focused, ambitious people that don't have kids, I just assume, and I think I'm right. They're just total fucking psychopaths. <laughs> I know. What do you do? What do you do all day? I, 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 all of my ambition was born from having a kid. Like it, it's hard because I, like I said, I've only ever been a parent, but like. Before I had a kid, you know, I was like selling dime bags in the back parking lot of my high school. That was my life. You really were the and, worst kid ever. And you when, did everything. When, like, I remember when my girlfriend was pregnant and, the, you know, I'm a teenager runaway and I have no money. And it's like, I was so excited because I finally had a sense of purpose. I was like, okay, this is why I'm here. This is my role in this world. And when it was like, well, what do I do now? It's like, well, fuck, I, I can't afford diapers. If the state of Connecticut didn't have a social program that gave me free diapers and coupons to go get milk, this kid would have no diapers and would be starving. It's like, fuck, I have to fix that. How am I going to fix that? And it's like, well, I got to use all my power. And what it meant then was getting two jobs, working 16 hours a day, washing dishes. And it's like, okay, this isn't quite enough. What can I do else? Like, it's not going to work here. Let me, I got I to gotta get the hell out of this small town. I got to move to New York City. This isn't working either. I got to do this. I got to do that. It was a kind of like psychosis, like this very narrow focus, like being shot out of a cannon. And I attribute all of that to being a parent. Like I always say, like he was like, I was never held back because I was a parent. I was enabled. So the constraints are focusing the energy. It was just the most empowering thing in the world. Like, why do you do it? Where do you get your energy? Like all those stupid fucking questions. I have a kid. I don't have a choice. No, it, it keeps you honest, right? Like you're saying, if you have uh, a morning routine, because that's when you get them to school, you have an evening routine, because that's when they get home from school, that's when you have to give them a bath, so you have to go to bed. It's, uh, you realize just how wasteful and inefficient you were able to be because you could be so. You, ha you had money and time and energy to burn. And when that goes away, ideally it forces you to be really focused and really efficient and to not accept waste or impositions or inconveniences and to do it right, not just because you should, but because, you know, the, the consequences of being inefficient and getting it wrong are so high. Where did those questions come from? Did they write those questions? Yeah, I guess. Oh. Um, no, I, I, had one, I saw one in here that w reminded me of something I want to talk to you about. I remember also when I was in your studio, I saw you had journals that you had written in your little white out, you'd put the year of every, you had journals going back for like 20 years. And I remember thinking, I really wish I had journals that way. And I think I said that to you. And then you said, well, you don't. And the second best thing would just be to start right now, right? Like if you wanna have this in the future, you have to start right now. And, and I love that. And that's one of the reasons I picked up that habit, which has been life changing for me. Talk to me about journaling. Is it still something you do? Was no, I'm too late. Like, <laughs> my iPhone fucked everything up. But oh, you just do it on your phone now? Like, no, right I now? just don't do it. Oh. Because I can be looking at Instagram instead. <laughs> um, but I have, for two, I have journals that go back you know, for 20 years. But I also have, there's two and a half years, maybe a little bit less of my life, where I didn't just keep a journal. I kept minutes. So I can go through the entire day. Not like hour to hour. It's like minute to minute. And I looked at it recently. It, it is unbelievable. You just did that on your phone or you did that in, no, in the journal? No, pre-phone. This was, I would take a single sheet of paper um, and fold it into eight eighths. So that's eight squares on either side. 16 days on one piece of paper. And then I'd write it what is the equivalent of like a, 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 a four size font. I mean tiny. Probably 300 lines per sheet. So each square would have, you know... Uh, 40 lines of, of text and right there where it's called the micro point pen. Uh, but I have those, they're in my studio. So I can refer back and this is the day exactly where I was and exactly what I did from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed. There's a journal, I'm sure they have it here. I sell it in my bookstore, but it's called uh, the one line a day journal. And it has five lines on each page. And each line is for each day of like each one day, uh, for five years. So I write one sentence. There's like three or four lines. You could, you could do exactly what you're saying, but I write one little line every day about the thing that I did the day before, something I was feeling, something I was thinking about, some milestone of the kid, you know, first tooth, we went here, first trip to this. And 
what's really powerful about it is, so you start it, the first year is cool, second year is pretty cool, the third year is really cool, the, fourth, the fifth year is amazing, because you're like, this is where I was for the last five years, and you can track, you know, here's the evolutions of the books I was writing, here's the evolution of my kids, of my life, things that were happening, um, and it's really, really powerful. So if people are thinking about a journaling habit, and, and that's something you want to do, that would be a good place to start. You know, I also have something that no one else on planet Earth has, and I don't recommend this to anyone if you value your sanity and well-being. I have 800 days of my life. Yeah, right. You can see your kids. In a very highly produced <laughs> 10 to 15 minute video that is like, you know, it's pretty, pretty acute. Those, they really get into it. And it's, it was like, I know then, I knew then, what I, that I was capturing my life. And I was like, oh, some days it's going to be interesting to look back on. And one thing that I, I think people have a tough time wrapping their head around, I don't want, once I click upload, I don't watch my videos ever again. Not like sometimes. I never watch them again. I have like four videos I've seen a thousand times because every time I do a speaking engagement, I play the same three videos. Like I, the snowboard one, everybody gets all excited. So I'll play that a million times. Fine. But there's a thousand videos and 800 of them are capturing a day in my life in sequence. And I've never watched any of them. And my daughter discovered them about a year ago. And I would like hear my voice in the house and like, I like one word and I can be like, oh, I know exactly what day, exactly where I was. I, Cause I ended that. Yeah. Like I played it back frame by frame to get it so precise. So I don't know what it, I, I don't know how this is going to totally fuck her up, but I'm sure I'm paying the therapy bill for the rest of my life for whatever it's going to do to her because she goes back now and is able to revisit her early childhood when she was a baby and understand exactly what her life was. So I, I think as I get older, as the space between me finishing that thing um, and where I am in the present, as that, as that, that chasm grows, the impact of those videos or the role they have in my life will become more and more profound or weird. Two uh, fast uh, ones as we yes. One more question. Yes. Who said that? Who's talking? Right? Um, two, 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 two quick ones as we wrap up. Um, what is your thoughts? I don't remember exactly. I think you, maybe you've gone back and forth. Do you show your kids in videos and social media? Do you have thoughts on no, kids and social media? No, all that. I Why mean, is that? I don't, because, so as my baby, Franny, like, she was in the videos until like, she turned 11 months old. And we just stopped because she was like, wait a minute, baby's all the same, but now she's starting to be recognizable. Moreover, when I started, I didn't have any following. So it's like, you know, you don't appreciate it. My mother-in-law doesn't understand why she can't put pictures of our kids on Facebook. But I just think we, none of us understand what the implications are. And when I see big celebrities, you know, pushing their kids out or posting pictures of their kids, I fucking judge. I judge them. Because they don't understand. But at least they're getting paid, right? Uh, the rest of the people that, that are doing it are doing worse. it to... to it makes yeah, it exactly. grosser. Like, but, but see, I would say, I would say like, it, you know, maybe the kids will inherit that money at some point. It's different than no, an it, average person who's just hooked on the, on the algorithm. The You're, kind of person that thinks it's okay to exploit their children is the same kind of person that doesn't put the money away for their college fund, but is spending it on a new handbag. I hate it. And I hate that YouTube doesn't have anything protecting YouTube or social media or the U.S. government, whoever the fuck should be legislating this. There are nothing. There are no rules protecting kids. Family blogging is the grossest thing that has ever existed. With like, If you're a parent, you know it is fucking hard to get your kid to behave, to get your kid to do those performances and to act happy all the time. For every smiling kid, like we brought our kids to Disney World, for every one of those videos, there's fucking six hours of the kid crying and screaming and the mother cutting all that footage out. And you see these horror stories again and again and again about like the abusive tendencies and the money and the exploitation of kids. Like I, I take that stuff so personally. So no, I live at the other end of that. Like we try our best and like, my daughter doesn't understand when people come up and ask me for selfies why she's not allowed to be in it because she loves attention. That's so great. And they're like, hey, can I get a picture? And she's like, I want to be in it. And she's like <laughs> jumping up and down. Like half the selfies people take with me have the, my daughter's forehead in it. Um, but no, I don't think it's okay. And I think that anybody who thinks that they understand what the long-term implications of putting your kid, like the internet is written in ink. It will never be deleted. And when they turn 18, they can go to the hell they want. And when I started making movies with my son, he was old enough to sort of consent and understand. And he's 25 now. He's like, how come we don't make videos anymore? And I'm like, you're in fucking Australia. 
Um, but for children, for babies, I take that stuff super personally. And um, no, I don't. But if you do, that's fine. No, no, I don't. I don't at all. Thanks. Uh, I, do, I don't for the, for the same reason. So I, I think of you, because uh, people ask me to sign, people give the Daily Stoic as gifts all the time. People ask me to sign it. And they'll be like, it's my friend's 40th birthday. And I usually write, uh, I usually write, happy birthday, uh, memento mori, make it count, right? Like your famous video. The idea that you sort of have one life, how are you going to spend it? Uh, and I thought we'd just maybe end on this sort of morbid note of uh, everyone in this room is going to die. And uh, you only have so much you only have so much time with your kids. How, how do you spend it? And, and how does that? So, so maybe just talk to me about or take us home with some idea of making it count and uh, the, the fragility and ephemerality of, of life. I just said this on a friend's podcast, but I had never said it before. I think I realized it on the podcast, but it was like. One thing that making a video every day of my life did is I needed to preserve my relationship with my wife. And by preserve, I don't mean the longevity of our marriage. I mean that if she was mad at me for a day, it would mean I wouldn't get her to be in my video. <laughs> and she's great. She's pretty. She's like funny. She's irreverent. I need her. Yeah. I mean, she's my favorite yeah. cast member. So we get in a fight like you do with your significant other. Bullshit fight. I didn't load the dishwasher, that kind of thing. And instead of pouting, I'd be like, uh, I got to resolve this so she'll be in my video. <laughs> and I think at the end of all that, the reason why I sought resolution, which was a very narcissistic, very self-serving reason, was irrelevant. The, what matters is that like whatever bullshit it was that we were fighting about was meaningless. Yeah. And had lightning struck, had something horrible happen, had a bus not stopped at a stoplight and something horrible were to happen to someone you love. Whatever little thing that you're upset about in that moment becomes meaningless right then and there. So why not just cut the fat and realize that like the details don't matter. And if you're lucky enough to have someone in your life that you love, especially if it's a child or, or a, a, a partner, that like to push the bullshit aside. And I say that like I'm smart or wise. We're good at it. We're good at it. My wife and I literally have couples therapy tonight that we rescheduled because I was like, let's just skip it. I'm doing the thing with Ryan. She's like, no fucking way. <laughs> we are doing, we have it tonight. So I try to live that. And it was something that I learned in the most back ass, selfish, self serving way. But it's something that I try to embody every day. Beautifully said. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks Appreciate it, everyone. Thank you guys for having me. See you around the ball.